this session. The, at the last session, uh, so to speak, before the complete session comes up. Uh, we're going to be having a very interesting discussion on something that engages all of us, and yet we are all part of it. Livelihoods in danger and shifting occupations. Especially in a post-COVID world, this is something that is going to be talked about and discussed for a very long while. So, uh, three people, very three diverse practices. It'll be very interesting to see and learn uh, and listen to them on the over-encompassing uh, over uh, subject of livelihood, but each of them has a, have, have been working in the different spaces. Uh, so it will be very interesting, so please stay on uh, with us. We'll start with Mukul. Uh, Mukul, uh, we'll start with you. Uh, it's a very interesting space that you're coming from, where, you, where, where you've been talking about caste versus identity versus nature. Uh, actually, over to you. Should I begin, Vishwa Jyoti? Am I audible? Yes. So, uh, thank you, uh, Vishwa Jyoti. And thank you, uh, Ravi and Ranjit, uh, Gote Institute and, and Amrita for this dialogue and for your invitation. So, in my presentation today, I will try to focus on the central role of labor and livelihood in forging relationship to nature in the everyday lives of laboring people and how caste and caste-based discrimination, hierarchy, power play important roles in endangering or shifting occupations. We know how the absence of labor within the frame of mainstream environmentalism has been critiqued. Uh, it has been asserted that a focus on work and livelihood can improve environmental discourses about the natural world, and we can get a better sense of the daily lived ecological experiences of the laboring population. Dimensions of labor can take us to different kind of environmental questions like what does it mean when work rather than leisure is your central ecological experiences? What does it mean when work is compounded by the inconvenient history of enslavement, bondages, pain? Here I can quickly remember now famous speech of Dana Alston, an African-American environmentalist at the first National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit uh, held in 1991 in Washington, D.C., uh, which was certainly a, a major shift from mainstream environmentalism. I quote what uh, C. said, uh, the environment for us is where we live, where we work, and where we play. The environment affords us the platform to address the critical issues of our time. Uh, questions of uh, militarism and defense policy, religious freedom, cultural survival, energy sustainable development, the future of our cities, uh, transportation, uh, housing, land and sovereignty rights, self-determination, employment, and we can go on and on, unquote. We also know how the absence of caste what I call caste blindness in analyzing environment and nature. In, in the earlier editions of a state of nature, nature dialogues, I have dealt in detail about the interrelationship between caste, nature, and talents. Today, in the context of caste, labor, livelihood, and environment, let me first state a few fundamental points. You know, caste creates a concept of natural and social order, where people, place, occupation, knowledge are characterized by pollution and ritual cleanliness, where bodies, behavior, situations, and actions are isolated, out of place, untouched, 
because of deep down hierarchical boundaries, casteism often rests on naturalism, where nature is used and abused to provide a body of knowledge, including locations and landscapes for determining individual collective identities and relationship in an ecological city. In, in such kind of a hierarchy ordered categories, lower caste untouchables are particularly tied with degrading, polluting traditional occupations. Their labor is bound by traditional old hierarchical conditions of human nature interactions. The degraded labor is a source of unequal and unjust distribution and consumption of fruits of nature. I would say that the process of being a Dalit is also a process of branding stigmatized labor as part of nature, a natural laboring technique that belongs to the body of a Dalit. So here, from the perspective of low caste and Dalit, you will see a different response about particular traditional occupations and livelihood options. I will give you one inter interesting example here uh, from Uttar Pradesh and Bihar states. Uh, this is North India, about a movement that was called Nara Maveshi movement, which began in 1950s and continued till late 1980s. Political scientist uh, Badri Narayan has extensively studied this Nara Maveshi movement, largely unknown till his study was published in 2011. The movement forcefully brought out and challenged the close links between caste system, occupational segregation, and Dalits. Nara Maveshi signifies two occupational activities are designated traditionally to the Chamar caste, women as midwives, cutting the umbilical cord, Nara, of newborns, and men manually disposing the corpses and carcasses of dead animals, Maveshi. Both these occupations have historically been tied with untouchability. Faced with everyday humiliation of their caste space polluted labor, while also receiving some grains and clothes in lieu of wages, Chamar men and men, women, mainly from these two states, decided to stop skinning and taming dead cattle and cutting newborns' umbilical cords. Narayan takes us through life narratives of several Chamars in the villages of these two states to show how they felt dirty and demeaning in their occupation. The movement spread widely, but also invited a range of painful and insulting backlashes from the higher and middle caste of the villages on the Chamas. Physical attacks, destructions of homes and property, imposition of economic sanctions, including no work on agricultural fields, no loans, no permission to collect firewood from the trees or walking through their fields, stoppage of uh, them walking on the roads, uh, stoppage of drinking water from the wells or using water for irrigation. Even the local shopkeepers were pressurized not to sell grains to them, while other communities such as washermen and barbers were asked not to render any services to the agitating chamas. The movement had multiple layers, violent oppression by upper and middle caste, a position by some other Dalit caste who considered themselves higher than Chamas, and conflict within the community between those who were fighting to leave their occupation and those who wanted to continue. So Narayan concluded, it's a huge study, that 1950 onwards, an awareness of not disposing of the carcass of dead animals had germinated in the Dalit consciousness that led to a large scale tension at different times and different places till 1980s. The movement played a significant role in liberating Chamars from their caste-based natural and social sphere. 
It expanded in its scope to include various issues of dignity and rights, while most incentive, intensive in 1950s and 60s, the campaign continued in these two states, uh, as I said, till late 1980s, and attempted to fracture the links between place, occupation, inherited status, and social hierarchy. It brought new perspective on Dalit meanings of labor and environment. However, there are also perspectives in our contemporary environmental discourse that champion the glory of caste-based occupation and its conservation. You will find many governmental and non-governmental organizations, their programs and activities, who work towards sustainability, technological improvement, better working conditions, health and safety issues in these occupations, but mostly within the dominant caste framework. Uh, we will find ample literature where physical labor in leather, rest collection, sanitation, rat picking, many others like handicrafts is idealized or romanticized in this approach. In the process, labor is separated from pain and revulsion, which is actually a part and parcel of Dalit or low caste or laboring performances. In fact, such caste insensitive, but environmentally sensitive sensibility sustains caste hierarchy in various initiatives, policies and governance uh, practices. Uh, take for example, uh, well-known Indian government National Action Plan on Climate Change. You must have read NAPCC. That hails the informal sector of waste picking and recycling as the backbone of India's highly effective recycling system. And NAPCC wishes to strengthen the informal sy sector system of collection and recycling. Similarly, several environmental organizations uh, meticulously calculate the mitigation of greenhouse gases by informal waste pickers. They are uh, characterized as a cooling agent, uh, climate entrepreneurs, climate champions, climate warriors, uh, who should be given rights, protection, incentive to do the same job that the Manu code has determined for them since centuries. Uh, it is no surprise that such climate mentality has no reference to its embodiment of in caste and polluted Dalit bodies. Uh, this is like new casteism uh, within so-called secular progressive environmentalism. Now, uh, one another aspect about uh, uh, labor, livelihood, and environment from the lens of caste. Uh, you know, in our country, in, in, in various states, uh, we have this uh, well-known midday meal scheme for school children uh, so that uh, they get uh, nutritious food and continue with their school education. Uh, this scheme is also uh, supposed to support the households and food production at its distribution. However, we also know that this entire program is also characterized by the caste hierarchy and the caste construction of food, school, education, and even children. Recently, you must have uh, noticed last month, a controversy happened in the midday meal scheme in a, in a district of Uttarakhand state where a Dalit cook, Sunita Devi, called Bhujan Mata, was removed from her work. It was a <clears throat> government intercollege in Sukhidan village of Champavat when upper caste students refused to eat the food cooked by Sunita Devi. The school management committee removed her. Of course, Sunita, Sunita Devi continues to fight for her uh, reinstatement even today. And there are support and solidarity for her as well. However, I would like to ask here, why the hiring or dismissing of a Dalit person from cooking food under the government scheme is significant for our understanding of labor, livelihood, and environment? What is the significance of a Dalit woman's struggle to right to access to a field of employment and opportunity? So, 
Gopal Guru, a known Dalit thinker and the editor of Economic and Political Weekly, has written about uh, Bhujan Mata's uh, struggle for uh, dignity. Uh, he says there are basically three objective factors that lead to caste discrimination in general, and in this particular instance, against the Dalit Bhujan Mata. Uh, according to him, first, in the Indian social context, interaction in the exchange of cooked food is governed by the ideology of ritual purity pollution. The taboos in uh, food interaction play regulatory roles in terms of maintaining social hierarchy that favors the upper caste, both for maintaining their social status and also for monopolizing opportunity structures. Second, according to him, such an ideology of purity pollution empowers the upper caste to maintain their exclusive hold over like many industries, like food and hotel industries. Third, in this particular case of Uttarakhand, the socially dominant desire to monopolize opportunities through the reproduction of untouchability and, and, and related practices. As the report showed, uh, the upper caste parents from the vicinity who were instrumental in using the caste background of the Dalit woman sought to mobilize their children against the Dalit cook. The boycott was aimed at restoring the job to an upper caste cook. So the continuing hold of casteism and Brahminism in social sphere deny Dalits an opportunity to move into certain economic and environmental spheres. This leads to my third and final point about uh, labor, livelihood, and environment. That is the working of the caste economy in India in all scales, small, large, medium, in anthropogenic activities, infrastructure development, urban development in every field of economy and society. I would say that along with capital or class, a caste perspective can foreground knowledge of the working of caste structure in economy, power, science, technology, in accelerating environmental changes. This frame of reference can focus on the nature and structure of production of goods and services and the organization of economies to create certain specific work profile along caste lines. Economic scholarship on the interrelationship between economic, caste, and Dalit in post-independent India can certainly throw light on how caste is being restructured to perpetuate discrimination and disparity in economy where upper caste at the top and Dalits and, and tribals are at the bottom. Uh, this scholarship also highlights that caste-based local economy is oriented to serve the interest of big capital and market under new global, global liberal regime, which accelerate environmental changes. Uh, for example, if you read economist uh, Ashwani Despande, uh, who takes a a macro all India view and uses large data sets to demonstrate the continuing caste occupation nexus and contours of discrimination in the modern Indian economy uh, based on uh, detailed field work of caste and business association uh, in, in market town of Adni in, in Tamil Nadu, northern Tamil Nadu. Uh, again, an economist, Barbara Harris White, uh, conceptualizes this caste corporatist capitalism that explores way in which caste is being reworked in the contemporary era to be an instrument of corporate regulation. Uh, Professor Asim Prakash shows how caste predominantly helps the accumulative endeavors of upper castes in market. These studies uh, provide us a conceptual framework as well as a ground knowledge on the development of market economy and interlinked processes of environmental changes, production, distribution, consumption, competition, technology, occupation. Uh, there is little work on how caste ideas, practices, and values influence environmental concern in economic arenas. Uh, it has been argued elsewhere uh, that male-dominated 
or women represented group have taken different decisions regarding environmental concern. Uh, many data-based studies also suggest that uh, conservative white males uh, or elite white men are significantly more likely to deny climate change than other Americans. Uh, the hyper-masculine character of banking industry is being pinpointed as an important reason for ignoring signs of finance and climate crisis. Uh, similarly, uh, an, an analysis of Sabarna effect on economic decision-making pertaining to climate change or environmental issues or occupation is relevant to see which values are leading to what, what outcomes in resource extraction or carbon emission. In conclusion, uh, from the perspective of uh, social justice and caste, there will be destruction or dislocation of traditional or natural basis of livelihood. Even if they look on the surface of it, environmentally sustainable, or the communities look to us sometime environmental sustainable communities. Um, there are several concrete proposals for uh, development with dignity. Uh, for example, uh, economist Amit Bhaduri uh, makes a solid case for the full employment in India in which growth, employment, environment, and development break systematically the social barriers of discrimination and prejudices based on caste, gender, language, or religion. Uh, in his solid um, um, academic work, he gives concrete steps of the programs for dignified and, and productive full employment. Uh, I seen there are many other initiatives like Vikalp Sutra, uh, that is collective actions for dignified livelihood, uh, where the dignified livelihood is being defined which ensures dignity and respect at work. Uh, ensure autonomous participation is based on uh, mutual cooperation and benefit and, and, and is uh, linked to conservation or, or natural resource-based green livelihood. Uh, so these are the efforts uh, that should also uh, draw our attention. Uh, but overall, uh, the situation remains uh, very complex and fluid. Thank you very much. Wow, that was that. quite riveting. Uh, um, that didn't feel like you, you overshot or been in your stipulated time. I, I was not really timekeeping. So, big thank you for that. Um, that was very, very interesting. Uh, you talked about, uh, basically, your talk remind, kept reminding me of one thing, as the whole question of nature and caste and the question of the sense of ownership of nature vis-a-vis -vis the corporate systems and economic systems that are being worked upon and and more more they move the more they're in the same place it kept remind me of um, uh, this uh, this question of question of ownership of nature and environment uh, and your locality as you said environment is where we live work and play uh, where you began it kept reminding me of om prakash valmiki's thakur ka kuha again and again Finally, Kate Takurka, Kuma Takurka, Pani Takurka, everything is Takurka. Baki sab idhar udhar. Which brings me to the next point where you talk about food and that cooked food is governed by rituals of purity, uh, which brings me actually to Rajeshri's uh, work uh, because uh, she has worked a lot on this perspective. And uh, Rajeshri is currently based in Holland on a residency and uh, is now working on another very interesting project. She's also showing at this exhibition where we are talking and uh, it'll be very interesting to uh, from you to hear Rajeshri uh, your your coming into this uh, into this in, into this framework and also what you're showing right now which might be pretty much interlinked to what we are discussing so yeah looking forward yes thank you uh, that was really interesting um, to hear I was making notes um, <laughs> But uh, yes, I, um, I'm showing a piece of ceramics in, uh, in this exhibition and it's linked to uh, these writings that I do around food politics, around uh, Dalit food culture. And um, I'll just give a little bit of a history. Um, Basically, this I've been working on this since about 2015, 2016. Um, 
when I was really interested in reading more about my own community's food culture, and I found that there were not many Dalit cookbooks. And the idea of Indian cookbooks, Indian food cookbooks were primarily vegetarian, primarily, you know, if there is meat, there's just chicken and mutton and fish. And um, even though my community, uh, many of us have converted to Buddhism and are vegetarian more or less now, um, but we do have these, these quite traumatic links to uh, eating beef and uh, in, so it was just interesting for me to find out more about this and uh, read more, but I couldn't find any cookbooks that are linked to these. Um, but at the same time, I started reading more Dalit autobiographies and uh, it, it sort of hit me that, wait, Dalit autobiographies are filled with experiences of food. Um, because I think with discrimination and particularly caste discrimination, not only is it sort of written down in the Manusmriti uh, of um, how to control these links of food and caste, but um, I think anybody, like a child's first experience of discrimination is through the stomach, is through hunger, is through realizing that, oh, you can't access this, you can't eat this food, you're looking at your classmates and can't eat their food. Um, and I thought that for, for this exhibition, because it was talking about new natures, uh, actually, yeah, we're, we're really, I think this panel is also talking about very, very old structures <laughs> within nature that keep replicating themselves instead of sort of creating new ones. Um, my work is called A Picnic and uh, it's, uh, a collection of small ceramic objects that look a little bit like food, but look a bit inedible, look a bit ugly. They could be food, it could be nature, it could be sort of in the surface of like, is it appetizing or is it revolting? Um, and I, I'll just share uh, one image of it right now. And then I thought I would read these uh, recipe books that I, recipes that I create uh, from the lit literature as a sort of context to it. Um, so I'll just share my screen, share. Can you all see something? Yes, great. Um, so unfortunately I don't have professional <laughs> photographs at the moment because all of this was installed while I was here. But uh, this is sort of the circle that's in the Goethe Institute right now. Um, and this was an image uh, taken while setting it up. Um, so if you sort of zoom in, there are pieces that kind of resemble bhakris, resemble sort of snacks and um, peanuts, uh, but also just leaves and petals. And it's shaped in a ring, uh, particularly to emulate people sitting together in a circle during a picnic. Uh, and I'm going to now, I'll just read out the recipe that relates to this. Oh, one second. What can we see? Can you see something called saved jar? Yes, perfect. So this is the booklet that I, I created for, for this exhibition. And it contains within it about 10 recipes. And what I do is when I'm, when I'm reading uh, an autobiography, I'll often just underline when the writer's talking about food and then I convert it into a narrative that sounds a little bit like directions, but you can't really follow it. So it's a bit like a recipe, but um, also highlights sort of the inability of it ever being replicated. Um, and 
picnic, which is what uh, what this this ceramic piece is particularly linked to. This is the recipe. I'll just read it out. Carry your tiffin of jawar bhakri and chutney tied up in dirty rags to the school picnic. After playing, settle down to eat. Boys and girls from castes like Wani, Brahmin, Marwadi, Muslim, Maratha, Tedi, fishermen, goldsmiths, and all the teachers might sit in a circle under a banyan tree. You might be asked to sit under another tree. The tree you sit under might be tattered like you. The wind might shake its branches, produce waves of hot air to hit your face. Sit in its broken shadow. Open your bundle of share your bhakri and chutney with the other Mahar students. Watch the high caste children offer their fried and tasty food to your teachers. Dare you offer your chutney bhakri to your teacher? Would he eat it? The high caste girls might offer you their curry and bhakris without touching you. They might see your food. Don't let it upset you. Try not to feel too ashamed or guilty. Sit like owls, watching the high caste children eating together and chatting. With each morsel of your crumbs, chew the lips of the laughing girls. The teacher might ask the high caste children to collect their leftovers on a piece of paper and give it to you. Carry the bundle of leftover food back to the village. Gather in a farm, open the bundle. It might contain crumbs of different kinds of food. The spicy smell might fill the air. Squat in a circle, stuff yourselves. Have you ever tasted food like this before? Your stomach might feel as greedy as a beggar's sack. When you get home, your mother, like the victim of a famine, might ask why you didn't get at least a small portion of leftovers for her. Leftover food is nectar. Her words might make you quiver. In school the next day, the teacher might ask you to write an essay on the picnic. How should you start writing? So this is um, this is picnic, and uh, basically I've adapted it from Sharan Kumar Limbai's book called Akkarmashi, the Outcast. Uh, the this is the English translation of it. So Limbai would have written it as you know. I carried my tiffin of jawar bhakri and chutney tied up, and then we settled down to eat. And so basically, I just I just twisted around to make it like to put the reader in the position of like being made to follow it. But then there there's this impossibility that I um I really want to highlight through the writing of you, you know even the idea of being able to experience another person's culture, experience another person's uh, life through food it sounds very romantic and beautiful, but I don't think it's essentially possible, especially like essentially true, especially when it comes to, uh, to a Dalit experience. Um, and it's also so filled with with trauma linked to to these very specific uh, caste doctrines that we still have to follow. Um, I thought maybe I could read just a few others which I've adapted from other writings. Um, so this one I've adapted from Om Prakash Valmiki's Juthan, and it's just called Pork. Um, if your classmates torture and torment you, you eat pork. Remember the tyagis who come in the darkness of the night to your home to eat pork. Remember the moneylender who demands pork and liquor before he gives your family a loan. This one is chicken from Urmila Pawar's Aidan. Uh, one second. Cook chicken on the stove on low heat all night. Prepare some ghavans. Pack the ghavans and chicken in a tiffin box. When your son is about to leave in the morning, hold it out to him. If he refuses, hand it to his wife. 
tell her to give it to him. Your son might repeat endlessly what had happened to him before until his bus is out of sight. Relive the time he appeared for his matriculation and you had packed some gavans and chicken in a plantain leaf for him to take in the bus to his hostel. On hearing the hostel was in a Brahmin lane, he had given your tasty chicken dish to a coolie to protect himself. When the boys at the hostel had come to know of it, they got very angry, having not seen even the feather of a hen for ages. Grieve over this for a long time. The next one is Thread from Sid Siddhalingaya's A Word With You World. Thread, at the Gandhi hostel, you might be given free food and accommodation. The hostel might conduct a yagna, a day of initiation into Brahmanhood with a thread ceremony. Take part, recite Sanskrit verses, wear the sacred thread they give you. With the sacred thread, some people might object to you eating meat. Yank it out angrily. Use it later to stitch your tattered clothes. This one is bag. Sorry, since I have 20 minutes, I thought I might as well read many of them. Um, this is from Eknath Awad's Strike a Blow to Change the World, um, which uh, is actually one of my favorite books at the moment. Um, it's called Bags. After you get married, there will be an extra mouth to feed. If you join your father as a potraj, a few more pieces of bhakri might fall into your bags. You may have absolutely no desire to leave school, but your relatives might think otherwise. They might drag you from your seat as you sit down to eat. They might call you a beggar for going to school instead of helping your mother and father. Feel the sting of their insults. Do nothing about it. Uh, this one is from Sujata Gidla's Ants Among Elephants. Roast venison. If you have gone without eating, tell your friends in irony that you have had roast, roast venison for dinner three days in a row. Laugh along with each other. And that's it. Yes. Um, yeah, I think I'll... Uh, I'll end now, um, but uh, yeah, I hope this gives some people some idea of um, what I'm trying to achieve with, with this writing and also the ceramics being uh, made of something uh, that is inedible, but also part of the earth. Um, so that's quite helpful for me to explore these mediums and not just through writing. But essentially, the recipes and doing this research of going through each and every autobiography that I can find, that is the backbone of my work. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Well, uh, Rajushri, I don't know whether to use the word beautiful, but though I much would like to use it, but I mean, you know, I mean, as you said, I mean, uh, maybe it's not the most appropriate word at this point of time, but the work is absolutely riveting. And you use the poetry as a form. I mean, you use the visual form is that, is that of a poetry, but actually it likes, looks like more of a toolkit of, you know, discrimination. Uh, these are the steps to do it, and there you, you do it. Which brings me to this question of what is the written versus the lived experience, you know? Uh, that is always the dilemma of the writer uh, and the artist in that sense. So the one thing that comes common from both, both of your talks is, is this whole question of Rosgar versus identity and where are you placed? And that's where it brings me to the next speaker uh, who's actually talking about another location which he has observed, uh, which was not there probably on the map as we know it now. Now it's in the news, it's on YouTube, it's on every channel, or it's rather taken away from every channel and uh, for, for reasons that be. Uh, but it's also a space which is also a work in progress and it's and, and one, one wonders where how far will that go. 
which brings me to kanchi's uh, uh, session uh, talk now kanchi uh, as as i said is is a researcher at the center of policy and research and uh, is going to be talking about the space that she has been observing uh, for a decade over a decade now and uh, talking to people conversations uh, around uh, well changing space changing livelihoods and of course bringing in sessions uh, aspects of both uh, progress vis-a-vis -vis identity community versus uh, corporatism that's moving in to a, in, in a place that was never one could never imagine so um, it'll be very interesting so now this is where this is where, this is where the my, my my political antennas go up and i i will be looking forward to this so over to you kanchi thank you uh, and thank you uh, for having me here it was i mean i'm i'm so mesmerized with the previous two talks that i think i'm going to take some time to uh, get out of that mode and take you where i was thinking of going um, i'm going to try and share my screen and i hope technology allows me to uh, at least travel with you to this place um, it's been it's been quite a journey to be working and interacting with the space uh, for a while now and uh, yeah just a minute okay uh, is it visible yeah okay uh, yeah so i i'm just going to uh, think this through uh, and i just wanted to flag that this is some of the thinking that uh, uh, i i don't think i i want to take this as my own thinking this is a lot of collective thinking that a uh, few of us who have uh, who have uh, traveled and uh, worked in this in this um, uh, in this region as well as all the interactions one has had with people uh, in the place people who work in the place who live in the place that i'm going to be talking about uh, i think it's it's developed through that uh, thinking churning and it's uh, it's been it's actually visually seeing it transform over a period of time has uh, i i don't really have uh, emotions to talk about it but I, it's just i suppose when i speak it will be uh, it would be uh, hopefully conveyed i talk about this place as uh, and and uh, you know title it today as peripheral uh, because uh, the place i'm speaking about is actually uh, it's on the margins the occupations i'm speaking about are also on the margins uh, uh it's also about a religious minority uh, group that is engaged in these occupations so in many ways a lot of what i'm going to be sharing is a transformation of what is has been on the peripheral uh so you know there's a there's a very uh, there was a very popular advertisement um, on television uh, which which invited everybody to uh, uh, to come to the state of gujarat and uh, uh, and the the advertisement went kach nahi dekha to kuch nahi dekha if you haven't seen kach you haven't seen anything and i think uh, i it just it was very interesting for some of us who have been observing uh, the place and uh, and working there uh, understanding the place and researching there is that it's almost like the story of kutch uh, and this particular part of kutch that i'll i'll zone into uh, actually can help us understand the political trajectory of india in the last 20 years uh, and uh, i'll i'm just going to try and um, visualize that and speak about it so the place i'm talking about is uh, a uh, a taluka uh, an administrative uh, sub sub uh, uh, block of uh, the kutch district of gujarat it's called mundra and uh, it's a beautiful landscape it's uh, uh, the the landscape is basically uh, you have intertidal areas that go you know that are as long as 6 to 7 kilometers uh, it allows a very unique sort of fishing uh, uh, activity there which is on foot fishing i mean people actually walk into the sea uh, uh, and actually uh, into the gulf and, act and and pick up fish and and bring it in their nets uh, it also is largely artisanal boats uh, small artisanal boats 
uh, that we are talking about. So it's actually, and, and most of this fishing is done by uh, the Waghir fishermen, which is a predominantly Muslim, Muslim uh, fishing community in the area. Uh, so this is just a visualization of actually you, if you just zone in, there is a person actually walking in with those uh, into the, and the, 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 the tide actually comes in for six, six, seven kilometers and goes back. It's, uh, it's, it's a extremely uh, fascinating uh, place to be in. Uh, it's also the place where most of India's and the world's Bombay duck comes from. I mean, the Bombay duck fish that you that you might get in Mumbai or it's exported out. The dried fish is from um, uh, is from this 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 part of uh, uh, the coast in India, and uh, you know a lot of the fish drying takes place in these in these coastal areas, in these intertidal areas, in ma with with uh, makeshift sort of uh, six uh, you know six to seven months people live in these small shelters in the area. Now. The place is, uh, you know, in many ways, Kutch as a area and Mundra uh, as an administrative block is in many ways on, in the corner of the country. You know, it's in one corner. Uh, it's also on the border and corner of a state. You know, it's not, even if you visualize Gujarat as a state, it's all, all, all it's on the corner. It's also, I think, on the, in the, in terms of, it's on the margins of our imagination of what that place could be. I don't think you can visualize Kutch, even for the people who understand coastal uh, geographies, Kutch is, and these, and, and, and this kind of uh, coastal area with intertidal areas of being six to seven kilometers is, it's really, you, you, it's visual, in the visualization and the ima imagination is, is really far, far away. Uh, and the occupations that we're really talking about, and I'll, I'll try and, uh, speak about them a little more are actually also extremely marginal they don't they don't belong to gdp you know uh, uh, the how uh, the economy calculates its income and its progress etc it's it's not it's not productive enough to be part of it so it's it's really it's really on the in the on the borders and the corners and the periphery of almost everything that we are talking about so it's really like that and it's uh, it's also for the for a long time, it's allowed the place to be in a cer certain way. And uh, I remember once traveling to the place and just being with on you know on the fishing harbor, and uh, just talking about it, um, uh, talking to people, and basically, you know that they said you know is saal uh, surkhab or kunj do pakshi hain, wo abhi tak nahi aaye, you know. So basically, painted stock and flamingos. Uh, this this time they've it's a little delayed you know i think they might there is some disturbance that is happening so uh, for a couple of years the the migrant uh, you know birds uh, you know had had not visited it visited the the coast as much as uh, people had understood it to be and there was some sort of some which khalbali hai something is something is not right now whether it's the local factors or global factors i'm not going into it but it's just that it's an articulation of how what people are feeling at that point of time is happening in the place. Uh, it's also it's an amazing sort of uh, so you know uh, it's occupationally it's so diverse because these intertidal areas also allow uh, you know when the tide goes is is back uh, allows for camel grazing of a very very unique uh, breed of camel uh, a rare breed of camel which only grazes in mud flats. Uh, here and the Maldharis uh, actually uh, are were able to use most of these places uh, uh, when they were accessible. It's also a place where there is salt production, uh, all of that, uh, and that's why I think in, in so this part of Kach nahi dekha to kuch nahi dekha is is very is very vivid. It's uh, you know it's uh, it gives a very different sort of imagination of a place. Uh, 2001. 2001 was the earthquake in Kutch, uh, the earthquake of Bhuj. And uh, this in almost, uh, you know, in the, uh, it, was, it was actually a very transformative moment for the place because in many ways, 
the reconstruction of Kutch and Bhuj became a way uh, that the place was being imagined as, as already destroyed and it's an empty space now. So we can actually, the reconstruction of Kutch and, and Mundra being one very significant part of it. Uh, it's, it's, it's seen as a moment where the place starts getting visualized completely differently. It's, it comes to the notice uh, very differently of governments, uh, of investors, of industrialists, of those trying to, trying to see uh, potential of, of Kutch for a very different imagination. You have uh, economic summits that are talking about large, large amounts of land available for X, Y, Z reasons, etc. So 2001 moment of reconstruction of Kutch is not just reconstructing people's lives, but reconstructing completely what, the, what that place should be. And, and you see that uh, really play out. You know, it's, it's like almost like a play in a few acts um, that you can, you can actually uh, you know, break it up over a period of time um, in, in the place. So in many ways, what happens is over, over the last, next last two decades is complete transformation of the coastline. And this is just, these are just dots to, to show you, uh, you know, port facilities, power plants, uh, planned and uh, you know uh, just dotted all across special economic zones all of it is really you know it's spread across uh, the, the coastline uh, and this is this this is not in the not the entire Kutch but this is Rajri Mundra that I'm talking about and suddenly the mangroves and the mud flats start looking different uh, it's not for the it's not for Pagadia and on for fishing and artisanal, artisanal boats or the camels or for or salt. Uh, it's you see different kinds of animals around there. Uh, the machinery enters, and this is the phase. In some ways, actually, I the the next set of pictures that I'll try and uh, you know speak through is basically a phase from you know what what there was a sort of. Uh, anticipation and acceptance of what was happening, uh, what was coming to, to Kutch to that of survival that we see today. And so initially, you know, there's something different that's going to happen. You know, this, this, this place is not even, this, this no, nobody really recognized us so far. Something really big is happening now, you know? So there's an anticipation of people in the area in terms of what is coming. Uh, and you don't you don't really know because you don't really recognize what is coming uh, or you know what good or the bad it's going to bring to you and nobody really explains it it's just considered to be good and it's brought in to the place so there's an anticipation uh, that you see uh, gradually uh, one part some some people actually are you know are accepting what's going to happen and let's we have we have some role to play in this this transformation you know at least those who are able to access the power elites uh, are able to be part of that project that you're talking about. But gradually, uh, there is that, that acceptance is also turning into resistance, uh, where people are not necessarily rejecting uh, what is coming, but they want a seat at the table. They want to be recognized as people who have been in that lived space, who need to be spoken to, who need to be part of the, I mean, um, either to say yes or no, uh, be part of a democratic process. And you, you start seeing that resistance really building up uh, in, the, in, in, uh, in Mundra, uh, you know, as, you, as the transformation starts showing its impacts, um, you know, both social and ecological. Uh, some of this resistance almost transforms into a visual coexistence. You, know? you have the fishing shelters as well as a power plant uh, where it's where it can be where it can be accommodated together it's it's happening it's it's you know your the the power plant is bringing in some water onto the fishing harbor uh, you know you have uh, corporate social responsibility that is making you reach you know creating schools etc all that that so, 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 uh, you know, sort of coexistence is uh, is uh, developing alongside some bit of resistance in an area and uh, you see that happen but grad till this time what you've seen you know what what satellites will show you is a complete transformation of the place you know you you see the the brown mud flats and the red mangroves turn into completely different uh, it's it's reshaped the entire place and what people could access and what they could do or do not could not do in the place so 
who really lives in that space completely changes. Uh, and it's determined by uh, a different imagination of, of um, Kutch. So this, by, by now, what, is, what, what has happened here is exclusion, you know, from an acceptance to the same place you could, you would find the camels there actually is gated. It looks, starts looking like a prison camp, almost like, you know, you need to knock at, uh, if you want to go into even some of the areas that you are accessible on paper, you need to knock at the gates of the company and, and go in, you know, only if you have certain political clout, you may be able to go in, all of those kinds of things. So it's visually, it's completely transformed. Uh, uh, you know, you see this space. And, uh, and, and if there are sometimes when you go to the space uh, uh, to catch now, you see this, you know, uh, this is not a choice people made uh, that they want to start. This is, the, this is the kind of occupational transformation that you want to make. And, uh, you know, the Maldharis who would probably have had to, uh, you know, either, either have, because there is no land available for grazing, uh, anymore, you have to actually sell your cattle or you cannot afford to keep camels. Uh, you start take, getting any occupation that would come uh, your way, anything that gets you some work to be able to survive, uh, feed your families, all of that is happening. Um, uh, so this is, this is basically a boundary wall of a power plant uh, uh, that I showed you in the coexistence slide as well. And this is the kinds of occupations that a lot of people are getting uh, and not necessarily their choice uh, that uh, because that the process didn't really allow for it. And so I just want to end by saying it's the same sun in Mundra and uh, but it's a it's a different Mundra now. It's the, and I'll just end there. Thank you. I wow. Just... Uh, I was expecting more gossip, but uh... Uh, but great. Uh, that's that, that's that's quite a uh, in-depth um, walkthrough to what's happening currently, uh, because what we get in the news is completely different. So big thing. I mean, so Mundra is also a border border uh, space where India ends. Uh, you know, uh, it's it's also the space where very you know beautiful bloggers bike with their way through. They go to the check post, they get their visas stamped, and then they come back, and then they just demystify the border for us. But you were actually doing a much more uh, intense uh, livelihood or another environment or a transforming uh, uh, walkthrough for us. So a big thank you for that. Uh, one thing that really comes up in all three of these talks that for me that, you know, one thing that comes out that the whole concept of livelihood is a project. It's actually the project. And one thing that I've always uh, picked Ranjit Hoskoti's brains about, uh, which I'm always working on, uh, is if livelihood is a project, land is the currency, uh, which is something that all three of you have talked about in, in, in one way or the other. That, you know, land becomes the currency of negotiation and, and how communities, castes, social identities work their way through in terms of visualization of that uh, aspect. Uh, you know, I mean, I've been working with the migrant workers in Gurgaon over a decade now, and I've seen that place transform, you know, how, how agricultural land has become corporate, uh, not corporate in the sense of uh, in the social uh, dwellings of, of, of actually of, of the labor that, that, that has moved in over the time. And one thing that you talked about was uh, the whole visualization, how the visualization is changing and, you know, and the transformation this becomes a process and the process can't be questioned now whether it's by the people who are living there or the people who have already been there for decades or centuries i mean they can't be questioned you can just accept it and move on uh, so this you know from acceptance to exclusion where it becomes a gated community all of a sudden which which also rajishi talks about which also mukul talks about that becomes this this there's a gated community there's a gate that's installed there's a barbed wire that's installed you ring the bell or pass the gate and all of that uh, from the acceptance to inclusion and eventually whether it's your livelihood whether it's your community whether it's your caste whether it's social identity it's also the acceptance of exclusion that this is how it is take it or leave it you know that's something that's pretty much coming across all 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 three of you um, 
in, in, in your talks. Uh, my uh, question uh, to Mukul, firstly, would be that, you know, you talked about that frame of caste reference, you know, caste-based small enterprises and economies actually feed into the larger space of the macro capital uh, framework, right? And in term, if, if we look at in the post-COVID situation where there's this whole large scale migration happened across communities, across castes, across the region from urban to rural, uh, it, 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 it was, we were expecting it to become at least a data, but we are told there's no data. You know, migration apparently has no data. Um, so forget uh, having any data, a caste based data or, or something uh, that is uh, constantly being contested. My question to you would be that, you know, if it's a part of a rather bigger framework, where do you see this going? I mean, migration has had a totally different uh, or a rather diff uh, elastic definition in a post COVID world, in the post first lockdown that, that, that India witnessed. Where do you see this going in the sense, um, vis-a-vis -vis caste, vis-a-vis -vis communities, vis-a-vis, -vis, forget livelihoods. I mean, that's of course the bigger question. Uh, where is this road going? If my question makes sense. Thanks, uh, Vishwajyoti. Uh, it's a very difficult question to answer where is this going? What will happen? Uh, because you have you have touched upon many things. A that of course uh, we talked about caste occupation located in the caste based hierarchy nature and environment. Uh, that also um, Rajesh Freevens he focuses on food uh, its relationship with uh, many various other aspects of uh, environment. Uh, then, then you are talking about uh, COVID, post-COVID migration, uh, lockdown-related migration, migrant workers. Again, I think uh, in this entire uh, two years, there have been good amount of research that this uh, post-COVID lockdown and migration and the caste and class uh, underlying of that. So that is one aspect. And then the futuristic aspect. Look, regarding this uh, COVID-related migration and its future, uh, it, this, this entire thing has to do with the uh, whole economic spectrum. Um, that how um, occupations will shift, uh, will whether take any kind of uh, uh, new shape or it will merge into different uh, existing shape uh, with the overall economic paradigm of the country under the various kind of ruling uh, dispenses. Uh, similarly, the mobility of migrant workers going back, uh, then returning again to the, the cities, uh, the crisis, the employment, the agony and the pain, that all has been uh, documented quite well. Uh, what I am actually concerned here uh, for the purpose of my focus uh, in this uh, panel, that whether uh, post-COVID world and and uh, all these uh, forced migration or or, or health environment-related migration will lead to any kind of caste configuration and and its occupational um, uh, scenario. I don't see. Uh, this entire situation of uh, post-COVID world uh, is going to change any uh, thing for the occupational structure. Because when I talk about the caste-based economy and, and, its, and, and its deep roots in our capitalist system, uh, then it has survived many ups and downs. It has survived the whole onslaught or whole on march of capitalism. It has survived the neoliberal global, uh, because there's studies that I have referred uh, of many well-known economists based on hardcore evidence uh, that shows that how uh, capitalism and its 
various avatars have been able to include caste uh, for caste capitalism nexus and related labor regulation um, and and related associations with various kind of caste based um, occupation um, great amount of work it's another matter that when uh, environmentalists talk about these traditional occupations and and and, it, and its uh, conservation uh, they sometimes don't relate with these uh, so my first take uh, about this uh, uh, post covid migration and its implication for caste based occupation uh, i don't see uh, any any uh, uh, breaking of the nexus uh, in, in this new world uh, that's, that in fact it's much it's very much possible uh, that um, uh, in in a given situation of uh, agony unemployment um, lack of opportunities uh, those uh, nexuses or interrelationship can be much much harder uh, much much uh, difficult to uh, break down so that is one second thing is that a uh, look about this whole uh, post covid or pre covid migration and mobility uh, for the low caste uh, or marginal uh, the the issue of mobility or or migration to cities uh, have always been a mixed baggage uh, it it's it's open up uh, new opportunities uh, of course now there has been good amount of research to show uh, that even the this uh, new world of cities and the hope for freedom uh, has many limitations uh, but is still uh, in 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 the lower caste um, and lower caste and occupation nexus in rural india uh, if you compare this with cities uh, gives you more opportunity and more freedom and so and that's why uh, whether pre covid or post covid uh, this relationship between migration and mobility in the context of uh, lower caste for the search of new livelihood option opportunities freedom and hope um, will is continues uh, in spite of uh, whatever um, options you try to give in the smart cities or or in the name of the smart cities or or ajivika or digital india or, or so on and so forth um, and 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 that will increase and that should increase that's why i i very much emphasize that uh, this this location destruction uh, of this so called uh, traditional natural basis of occupation and environment will continue uh, it's not all the time uh destructive uh, in in from the eyes of uh, lower caste people who are looking for new opportunities and um, so that is the pre or post covid i don't see uh, so in that cell uh, vishujyoti vishujyoti uh, my take is that from the perspective of low caste occupation uh, the situation will either remain or it will aggravate further uh, In 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 the in even in the post COVID world, yeah. Over to you. In that sense, uh, taking away from what Mukul uh, just said, I mean the whole question of transformation in terms of the land and 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 the environment, uh, Kanchi. Uh, your work is still a work in progress because I mean, however that's one much been done to that land. I mean it's still karya uh, pragati par hai. and uh, some massive dreams have been set in that space that you've been talking about what is that you hear from the la- from the field what are the conversations people have because they are a part of the transformation now they are getting jobs there i presume they're getting part of that they're moving on from one generation is moving from one uh, livelihood to another set of livelihood which probably they were they had no idea about what is the kind of conversations that are happening on the land uh it see this is uh, see this area is very it's very interesting as an area because uh land here is has not been so much under private ownership there are farmers who are uh, who who are pri- privately owned farms so there is a that's a very different negotiating position but most of the coastal commons that you're talking about are you know may be considered to be government waste land you know or under some other government jurisdiction where people would have use rights or these would be f- uh, fishing grounds so coastal commons are actually uh, you know one of the uh, i mean this is the place where you see how large tracts of unutilized 
uh, commons where you could have a seasonal pastoralists, seasonal fishing communities, uh, you know, seasonal salt production, uh, actually really as very important thriving occupations. Uh, and, and they, I mean, so your, your, your space for negotiation for many people is just not there because you, you don't necessarily own us. There's no, there's no ownership, uh, you know? So, and so unless regulatory processes, uh, uh, public participation processes open themselves up to speaking to and, and bringing people in that conversation, uh, you, many people are just left out. Uh, so, and, and uh, I mean, you, you might have government documents to say we will keep the area free from all encumbrances for fishing. But the fact is, if, if a certain different kind of, uh, a, a different kind of, uh, uh, you know, if, if you're creating new enclosures, the space uh, for uh, the occupations that people know is, is squeezed out. So you, you have very little smaller spaces and it gets, it gets, even the boards get crowded. So there is an intern, there's a tussle even, even there, you know, that's happening. That is not to say that there is, um, I mean, there's no political expediency and people are not, uh, there is a whole bunch of people who can negotiate, who are able to be a part of that project are, are definitely trying to, uh, you know, um, uh, have, have, been, have got into the job system. Mundra's demography has actually changed dramatically. Uh, I think you, if you, I don't have the figures, but you see a whole, uh, it's no longer the play, pe people who were, who were, who were uh, living there. There's a lot of people from different parts of the country that is, uh, uh, you know, who have actually now settled in that, in that town. So there's an old part of the city. So it's no longer the same space. So, you know, so, there are people who have been able to negotiate being, uh, you know, driving, uh, say, supplying groundwater or, you know, um, ve vehicles to the to the port authorities or some bit of tourism or some some sort of other kinds of uh, things that are happening. But a lot of labor is from outside. Uh, you have a whole bunch of a uh, lot of contract labor in the port, in the power plants, uh, in the labor colonies. There's a completely new, different set of issues. Uh, in the place, so that interaction is um, is 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 worthy of very detailed study. But for all I know is that there is conflict. The, 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 there are there are local uh, local politicians who are involved in mo you know mobilizing um, uh, migrant labor in the area uh, who ha who have really poor living conditions. Uh, so all those kinds of near newer issues are coming up. Many others are actually out of that project. It's 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 a, it's a it's a world. See, with special economic zones, it's a world unto itself. Mm. You can't see what's happening inside unless you're really inside. So for most others, you know, there's a world outside, and then you knock, and you, if you're inside, you you understand what's uh, you can understand maybe what is inside. So it's very so for a place that was largely commons, openly accessible, you could see visualize experience the place differently. Suddenly, there is a there's a barricade. So you don't know what is happening there. You know, inside it's it's a it's a complete transformation of a of a place and 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 uh, people. So it's it's very stark in many ways. Very interesting. I mean, and that would actually to the last probably I'm asking asking you, Rajeshri. I mean, in the sense of this transformation, the transformation of land versus the transformation of conflict. Uh, the conflict of experience and so and even the conflict of experience is going through a certain transformation how much do you how how do you think that's likely to inform or 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 uh, be addressed in your work transformation of land and transformation of experience like going through that um, yeah, transformation of conflict in, uh, in, in in that sense because even yeah. that is pretty much a uh, part of the experience that you talked about it yeah and much of this is that is actually a lived experience which you're trying to reprocess so and uh, it's not going away any time soon so in that sense how do you think that's uh, going to in, in, inform or be addressed in your work if that's I, an issue? yeah i mean i'm i am quite like fascinated with exactly like that um linear or non-linear morphing of caste experience uh, through sort of 
um, through the autobiographies and also through uh, any Dalit person's lived experiences, sort of mm. starting with maybe hunger, but then going through till the end, um, where it's not just hunger, it's not just begging, it's not just eating leftovers, but it's about, okay, here you are as perhaps a, a, a rich, well-to-do Dalit person and you're sitting with upper caste people, how are they going to treat you while you're sitting at the table with them? Will, you, will they allow you to sit at the table with them? What about then your discussions on food? What about then your discussion? And it's not really about food per se, but it is this navigation of caste experiences that uh, of like everyday caste experiences in places that are public in places that are private in places that are so-called like natural and open but who is it open for like uh who is it uh accessible to and um actually i learned a lot as well from mukul sharma's book uh cast and nature as well um about the sort of transformation of um caste experiences uh particularly in rural areas personally i've never felt comfortable in rural spaces so this like larger sort of mainstream narrative of you know rural beautiful uh, india and uh, has just never made sense to me and it was only when i learned to unpack things to do with my identity that i realized like okay yes this is why because my ancestors were probably not allowed to cross a certain space, not allowed to access things, not allowed to own land, not allowed to grow their own fruits and vegetables. And um, so what impact does that have then on me, who's a fairly, uh, you know, I can access a lot of spaces. My caste experience has also transformed through thousands of years. Uh, but yet my blood is still Dalit. Like my, uh, unfortunately, my status in the caste order does not change. Um, so I don't know, it, it's going to be interesting also growing up in this uh, situation and seeing how people's uh, interactions with me keep changing, perhaps. Uh, interesting, that- I mean- yeah, I mean, as I said, it's it's still a work in progress. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think Ravi Agarwal has a question for one of our for one of the speakers. I was just thinking uh, about uh, you know I had this image of every politician going to a Dalit house and eat before an election, and food becomes the sort of metaphor for you know equality and secularism in a sense. Uh, but Ravi, but I, interestingly, Ravi is stopping you here. Interestingly, often the food comes from outside. Okay. That's also been noticed. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, no, I'm also thinking about uh, intra-community dynamics. Of course, these are, these are very traditional and old uh, constellations which continue to exist and will, as Mukul says, will continue to exist and maybe become uh, more uh, sharp in the future. But I'm also interested in uh, thinking of communities as fractured places, uh, both in terms of uh, uh, how they navigate change, economic change, urbanization, uh, opportunity, uh, what happens inside the community, uh, as, uh, and how different alliances get formed uh, across, across community. And the idea of the community, which I think we've always uh, mobilized as something is also kind of a little romantic idea of what a community really is. Uh, Of course, classically from a gender perspective, uh, because we never think of community as gendered, but also in terms of, uh, you know, if you, economic opportunities, urban, you know, how the world is changing, and whether these new alliances, uh, and that's why I gave the image of the politician eating there, these new alliances, because, you know, the the earlier Brahmin parties could not get the kind of majority without the backing of uh, other castes. So there's been a sea change in the kind of alliances which have formed politically in the country in the last 10 years. Uh, so what, do, what implications do they have 
in the future about these castes, these sort of community divisions, and uh, how do you see this change in terms of identity politics or identity res resistances or new alliances? Uh, Mukul, would you like to take that? Uh, thanks, Ravi. I'm seeing your back from here, Ravi. I wish I could have seen your face. I always, I always love seeing you, so fine. <laughs> uh, thanks, Ravi. Uh, so, look, there are, what he was saying, Ravi, is coming out very sharply, uh, concretely, not only in the context of electoral politics, but in the past 10 years, or more than 10 years, uh, in our social, political, economic, environmental plan. plan. A, that... Uh, on the one hand, when we are seeing uh, the various fast-moving um, capitalist project in terms of development uh, and, and its various manifestation in our country under the pre present political dispensation, uh, on the other hand, uh, and that's why it's very much important for us to think of economy not only in terms of capital and class, but also in terms of caste, and to talk about the caste economy. Uh, the, the, the emergence of a, a aggressive new Brahmanism uh, within the uh, uh, political and economic uh, model uh, in the past 10 years and so. Uh, and it's not, uh, you, can, you can discard me because, uh, but, but if you read, some of the recent writings of John Dresch, uh, who, who has been working uh, on, on some of the grassroots issues. Uh, and his, his writing on this new Brahmanism emerging, not only in the various government uh, uh, social welfare scheme, but also uh, in overall uh, project of political economy. And initially, as I mentioned, that in various other works of Ashwani Jaspandi and others have highlighted. But one trend is that uh, more aggressive emergence of uh, uh, new Brahminism and uh, that kind of a domination in the political social. Uh, on the other, what we are, uh, when we talk about the low caste, uh, Dalit, its occupational political space, uh, there is more and more fragmentation, uh, uh, more and more uh, emergence of uh, group-wise um, uh, identities, uh, caste, subcaste, subcaste, uh, uh, which is uh, at, at, at one plank, at the plank of social empowerment at the local level, could be empowering, uh, could be um, politically rewarding. Uh, that is very much obvious in the entire North India and also to some extent now Western India. Uh, but on the other, uh, in terms of thinking of a, a broader uh, political or environmental project of Dalits, um, uh, forging whether dignified employment or dignified livelihood or thinking in terms of Dalit ecologies is becoming more and more complex and challenging uh, because of this. Uh, so first thing I said that uh, a consolidation and new emergence of Brahminism in the economic and political sphere. Second, I'm saying uh, that a, an increasing fragmentation of um, uh, Dalit ecology, you say, or, or, or caste or Dalit assertion, you say, whatever that is second. Uh, and third, actually, it's now also becoming uh, um, slightly, this, is, this, this trend is also emerging, um, that though people have worked and we would like to work on this uh, uh, Bahujan Dalit Bahujan political economy and environmental economy. Uh, but in many parts of the country today, uh, there is, uh, uh, within the fragmentation of Dalit politics, you are again seeing the further fragmentation between the Bahujan politics, between the Dalit and Bahujan politics. Uh, in concrete political terms, we can say OBC politics and, and Dalit politics. Uh, so, uh, so this, this caste economy, further consolidation, uh, then fragmentation, uh, then Dalit Bahujan and, and question marks on the Dalit Bahujan uh, make, make things 
it's um, actually making things very volatile, uh, socially, economy, politically, all over the country, especially in uh, northern, western, and to some extent in, in, in southern India. So, uh, the, the, in, in, in that context, Rabi, because we are talking here the state of nature, uh, it, it, it becomes very challenging to understand the idiom and the law and language and the politics and try to give it a, uh, a try to understand its, uh, its political expression um, and how will it be a liberating or, or will take that path of liberation. Um, it becomes more and more uh, challenging because uh, what, what uh, in, in the context of Vishwajyoti, I said that I see uh, these nexus between occupation and caste getting more sharper, coming under more pressure, um, uh, getting back to the whatever liberation people have achieved in the past few decades, uh, getting back to the previous one. So in that context, um, uh, the, the, it becomes more and more, more challenging. So that is my very gray kind of, there is no, uh, I would say, uh, Ravi, that um, anybody who is uh, willing to or, or trying to understand the politics of nature, environment, caste, low caste, um, uh, is, 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 is really uh, in a difficult, um, challenging situation. Uh, coming from UP, because that's all that I can think of right now and being there and part of the thing. I mean, one thing that Mukul's uh, thing that takes me on uh, from here is basically the term that we now get to see here in a lot of politics is that, and taking what Mukul just said, I think this whole concept of Samajik Dhruvikaran and Prakritik Dhruvikaran will keep happening and will get more complex as we go by. That's what uh, it seems where we are going. I would also just add here, uh, I work with some groups actually, just, just to add a footnote here, Vishwajit and uh, Ravi, if you may allow, Vishwajit, uh, that, uh, look, uh, I, I try to work with those groups who uh, try to include some of these environmental issues in the political mass manifesto of Dalit parties, so-called Dalit and OBC parties. And uh, we have drafted a few things and we need to, uh, uh, UP and, and uh, Uttarakhand, especially two states uh, where these parties have some strong base, uh, whether it's a Samajwadi and, and Bhojan Samaj party and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, at the end, uh, there was hardly any taker. So uh, of, of some of these uh, points of ecology, environment and environmental politics. So uh, that is another uh, political, it was much uh, slightly relatively easier uh, five years back or 10 years back, but this time uh, uh, this was almost a dead end in two states. That, uh, that, also, that also comes across much more in Kanchi's thing, that there, is no, there are no takers for ecology here. We are not, let's not uh, be under any of this illusion, that there are no takers for ecology for sure. We also have another question from one of those uh, listeners here. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, am I audible to everyone there? Yes. Right, okay, thanks. So, uh, Amit Angshu here, and I just wanted to, it's not a question, I just wanted to add to something Kanti said, because my research was in Bhuj. And uh, so, uh, you know, I used to go to the morning markets, Kanchi, just to hang around and see what kind of products are being used and all. So, there were these uh, bubble twigs that people use for brushing their teeth. And for a lot of people who are, you know, very poor laborers, who can't really afford to buy toothpaste and toothbrush. The babool twig does both the work together. That's what the thing is. So I was very curious and I was asking them, okay, you know, what is this occupation about? Where do you get your babool twigs from? And they were from Mundra. And what they told me was that, you know, we don't get this anymore because these babool trees have all disappeared because of the coming of these industrial areas. And it kind of strikes me how, uh, how this massive transformation of the landscape is shaping different kinds of habits in different ways and also taking things away. And we, these are all fragmented. We really don't have a full picture of the ecological change because they're fragmented. And we have to find a way to bring it all together. Because these are small, small stories. Some of them are large ones also. And the funny thing for me was that we talked about, you know, transformation. And it's also agricultural transformation of Kutch, which amazes me. 
because now a pastoral area with commons access is now increasingly coming under the you know private cultivation dragon fruits are being grown in the desert areas and they are all being exported out dates are being exported to the middle east while a babul twig is no longer available available which was earlier available to the people so suddenly it kind of completely reconfigures what the environment how you know is for and who is it for because it's all for consumption within a capitalist uh, transformation of landscape so this was just my two bits i just wanted to add to it thanks yeah i mean this is uh, uh, if i may just respond and just add to it i think this is <clears throat> very interesting dimension because also it you know makes me <clears throat> think about uh you know i mean a large part of the transformation is of of the much more coastal hinterlands there are inland areas which is mundra was always known for as for its uh agricultural uh, uh you know it it was always a place with more water all of, from uh, other than you know, most of the other kach Uh, parts of kach are uh, much more dry mundra was one thin stretch which was always known to be horticulturally very very uh, important it was always uh, connected to the world uh, you know always exporting fruit all of that so it's interesting to say that a lot of that inland area uh, of private farmers still remains very much in business although they are also impacted by you know access and um, pollution and all those kinds of things as well but that still is it's still int- intact but it's the other occupations that are completely i mean even and, and some of what i've actually spoken about are are the more visible ones you know there are in you if you see uh, legal processes or regulatory processes and how much they have hidden uh you know in about the place before these tra- that that had and so there are almost these documents are curated to uh to allow for this in, this form of industrialization to enter the space you, know, you actually show it as a backward uh you know poor uh, needing uh, development sort of space and these these spaces are, are curated in fact small uh, you know i mean and actually speaking if you do uh A, a demographic profile about what is completely bl- missing is like you know uh, what i've heard is like there are there was very unique form of the you know the mud of the mud flats was used for very interesting pottery now that figures nowhere because it's it it is not even counted in the local economy as salt or fishing you know who 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 really bothers about uh, you know pottery in um, uh, in that area so so th- those kinds of things are very important and i think what gets lost and what 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 remains even in this transformation is a is a huge political question and, uh, and has 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 uh, has can be understood for uh, from the point of view of religion uh, the political expediency who is it able to negotiate and who is who is excluded from the process very interesting um very very interesting uh thank you amitangshu for that uh, question and bring that out because and um, that's something that we see that here pretty much in north in india as well yeah uh rajeshri maybe you can answer this question this is a question from parak tandel uh that is there anyone who's would you know of anyone who's documenting dalit languages or even word banks uh it, in terms of dalit languages uh for, i mean i know a lot of eknath awad also wrote about, about it a bit but i i think i i do primarily focus on uh, english and english translations because i think uh, awad also speaks about this sort of romanticization and nostalgia on uh, you know our dialects which of course are important but they also uh, signify our non access to classical uh, d- classical sort of languages like even whether it's like pure marathi or pure um, sanskrit and and so um i i do <laughs> unfortunately or fortunately do sort of focus on english specifically because um that was also what was most important for my upbringing and for my mother and our whole family that no we you know if we get some access we need to access english and we need to get like that's how you then try and try and break out of the system um and i think 
unfortunately that has left me a bit sort of dry with um marathi being my mother tongue but uh, say not being as confident in it as i am in english um but i think it is important as it is with food as it is with public spaces and nature to sort of just remove that nostalgia and just remove that romanticization of these spaces because i do think these spaces have always been very very violent in uh, in their navigation uh, as as sort of i think mukul sharma had this term of casteized nature um uh so even when it comes to language even when it comes to uh food habits and cuisines or uh occupying space and mobility uh, there is this discomfort that people from minority communities have to deal with of leaving their past behind when it comes to progress so maybe you know stopping eating beef stopping uh doing these jobs that are demanded of you and going into these other spaces that are colonial in their own way but we also come from a colonial uh legacy which is the caste system um so we're not really i don't know where our decolonization sort of starts if we were within the caste system to begin with um yeah I, i would be interested in also learning more about that yeah okay. rishuti quickly wanted to add here what uh, rajeshri has said this can i can i add here this one line yeah. two lines so look when you began uh, vishwajyoti you mentioned about om prakash valmiki uh, rajeshri of course mentioned about many uh, including uh, balmiki and 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 sharan kumar Lim, limbai and others then see then see so the point here is that when we try to understand whether the transformation of place or experience or touch or feel uh, we need to also and i think in that in that respect uh, people like rajeshri are doing really really great work uh, we need to also build a different kind of archive of of our knowledge um, of course i am here not only talking about the somebody coming from dalit and somebody not coming from dalit that of course a big archive um, uh, and 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 that must be um, um, uh, explored and, and 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 read and and respected and understood and so on and so forth not in any patronizing manner um, but but when you try to understand these dynamics of transformation of experience place etc etc which kanchi has so well documented unless you get into the various kind of um, expressions coming through writing uh, speaking uh, songs uh, posters a uh, little magazine in languages uh, and and sometime also getting translated uh you won't be able to understand the these these complex dimensions of experiences and transfer true yeah and and there is and there is and there is a uh, there is a revolution or explosion of uh, those kind of literature coming from uh, whether low caste or whether ex untouchable or from gender or from explosion um uh, everywhere if you go to nagpur um in this annual uh, ambedkar thing or if you come here in december in delhi uh, during the ambedkar punyatithi uh, you will find hundreds and hundreds of uh, small small stories yes. studying those literature uh, coming out with stories poems commentaries histories uh, discourse environment all these things yes. so i'm i'm just making a small point sorry i have taken long uh, creating a, a new archives of of knowledge then one will be able to um, of course i am not competent uh, some might not others be competent uh, coming from different background uh, but it needs to be explored further um, uh, in some other way 
and and very, when very somebody has asked about the language ask about the vocabulary it's very very required very very very, very important point the, the need for archiving very very important point yeah. thank you uh, i think broadly we are done here uh, it was great talking to all three of you from very three different forms of practice and standpoints and for me personally it was a great amount of learning uh, so taking thank you for taking me this through and thank you goethe institute ravi agarwal ranjit hoskote amrita the whole harkat team a big thank you for actually bringing us together i mean otherwise we wouldn't have probably met so uh, great and hopefully looking forward to the next edition next year thank you thank you everybody thank you take care bye bye stay bye -bye. safe uh, i liked very much the fact that um, at the close of the discussion there was this talk of new archives and i was just thinking then that there's also such a major role for translation in this context because increasingly the narratives of the marginalized are appearing in multiple languages across so called desh bhashas but also in english and thus achieving i think a larger audience a larger sense of participation and reminding us of whether it's the dalits or the obcs or other historically marginalized communities their share and their participation in the so called indian modern i think this is really really significant and uh, again thoughts that will will i think come up when we move into the the concluding session which will be in half an hour now yeah so we'll see you in 30 minutes thank you so much